Welcome back, you Petamaniacs. It is Chris Nichols here with Petapixel. Today we're going to be talking about our favorite lenses from Canon RF mount. And yes, they're all going to be Canons because, well, that's just how they roll. Hey, Jordan, before we start our Canon RF lens rundown, uh, you were trying to buy some vintage lenses privately. How's oh, that going? don't remind me. It's been an absolute nightmare, okay, with all the haggling and the no-shows and the people inviting you into their basement. I'm never doing it again. It's okay. the worst. Just calm down, you madman. Why aren't you using KEH.com? Who? KEH.com. I Who? mean, they've been around since 1979. They've got 60,000 items plus for sale. I mean, the beautiful thing is their experts are going to take a look at everything, restore it with care. Uh, you know, they give you a generous 21-day return policy. You won't find that problem. Privately, you know, you get 180 days warranty, so you know it's gonna work. You should really be going there. No haggling, no nonsense, safety and security. Oh, finally, peace of mind. Yes, kh.com. Go now and just stop yelling at me. Now, Jordan and I started a series where we looked at our favorite lenses amongst many different camera brands, and we've gotten through most of them, but today we're doing Canon RF. Today's the day, and it might actually be then the happiest day of your life watching this video. I certainly hope so. Now, we are gonna be focusing on full frame lenses with the intention of using them on full frame Canon RF body. Absolutely, though, you could use a lot of these in APS-C bodies as well. And I've actually used a lot of the Canon line of lenses. I've used almost the entire lens lineup. So uh, I've tried all these. I like all these. So here, let's get to our opinions. So let's start things at the ultra wide range. My first choice is gonna be the 16 millimeter F2.8. It's a prime, but it's compact and it's affordable. And if you just need the occasional ultra wide look for your shots, I think it's a great way to go. But if you do need the versatility of a zoom and you have the budget for it, absolutely. The Canon 15 to 35 F2.8 L is a fantastic choice, but it's not my favorite. But you know what really makes me happy in the ultra wide category? It's actually Canon's 14 to 35. I mean, this is a great example of where an F4 lens will be more affordable, more compact, lighter weight, and yet still gives you professional grade shots. And I just think in my particular situation, if I'm shooting landscape, if I'm shooting architecture, I'm gonna be stopping down the lens anyways. If I need the light, I can raise my ISO one stop. I don't consider it a big deal. And so absolutely, the 1535 is a great choice if you want that 2.8 aperture. But I think for most photographers, the 1435 will suffice and they'll love it. Ah, I'm charging Jordan's camera battery. Stop it, it sounds terrible. Oh, okay, well. I have spares. Okay, oh, well, why didn't you tell me before I got that? Okay. So next let's talk about prime lenses that cover the normal range. And this is a weird talk because frankly, there's just not a lot of choice and that's actually kind of a problem. So certainly the 50 millimeter 1.8 STM, nifty 50, always good choice. I mean, I'd always say that's a great way for a lot of people to go. It's affordable, it's sharp and it's small. There is a 35, honestly, I mean, it's not just me being biased against 35 millimeter lenses. Jordan even doesn't really find it to be a, a very standout lens. So. My choice is going to be a bit of an extravagant one, but I do stand by it. I'm going to go side saddle here because kids' seats are just not made for adult butts. All right. So my choice, my extravagant choice is actually the 50mm f1.2. And I understand that not a lot of people are going to be able to afford a lens like this for something that just covers a normal range. But it's an incredibly sharp lens. Normally, f1.2 lenses have a lot of optical deficiencies. But in the case of the 50mm 1.2 RF, it's usable wide open. You could do a lot of interesting portraits, like full body stuff, group stuff, but where you still want to blow the background out of the way. It is a bit bulky, but I do really like it. Next, let's talk about standard zooms because this is the lens that most photographers will use most of the time. I'm normally a big advocate for 24-105 F4s. I don't mind they're slower, they're versatile. The Canon RF one though, you know, the barrels loosen up with some use and I find that they're not that sharp close up, although they are nice and sharp at regular distances. You know, some loca issues, I, it's not my favorite. It's fine, it's fine. But what about the professional 24 to 72.8? It's got image stabilization, beautifully built, very sharp lens, carries on the standard that the EF version carried on and being one of the better general purpose 2.8s out there. But it's still not my favorite because my favorite lens is one that I just always end up thinking about. I don't know why. It's the Canon 28 to 70 F2. It's a weird choice. It goes against everything that I normally say, but every time I use it, I just love it. I mean, it's got beautiful soft bouquet. It's a sharp lens. It's great for impromptu portraits. It's huge and it's expensive. And you know what? You should probably get the 24 to 72 instead, but this is my favorite list and it's by far one of my favorite lenses of all time. 
So next, let's talk about telephoto and super telephoto zooms. And I mean, you know, there's just not that many here to choose from. So first off, I want to say the 100-400 looks really cool and it's very affordable. I've just never personally tried it, so I can't speak to it. But having an f5.6 to f8 aperture, I know that's why it's affordable, but that's pretty slow. I have used the 100 to 500 and I love it. I get that it's very expensive. That 4.5 to 7.1 aperture is faster enough to make it worthwhile, especially considering it goes to 500. And I know a lot of photographers have poo-pooed that lens, but I think it's fantastic for wildlife. But you know where we are so lucky is when it comes to Canon 70 to 200s. I love both the f4 and the f2.8 versions and they do something truly unique. They give you a lens that is very compact, way smaller than they should be and it's actually really convenient when you're carrying them around. The only downside is they don't take teleconverters which means you might still have to look at a 100 to 400 or 100 to 500 or a fixed prime when you want to shoot wildlife and that is a big downside. Me personally, I think the 2.8 is the better way to go, but the F4 is baby small and still very professional in sharpness. Uh, both fantastic choices. Oh, and I almost forgot to mention, what about the just recently announced Canon RF 1 to 300 2.8? Lots of potential. We actually have it. We're testing it right now, but have enough time yet to really make a decision about it. So it's not going to be in this video, but you should definitely check out the full review coming soon. Now, what about portrait telephotos? Well, actually, Canon do have some very interesting choices here. The 85mm 1.2 carries on the tradition of their classic EF 85mm 1.2. It gives you very soft depth of field, beautiful bokeh, still a little bit slow focus heavy and expensive but then you also have the 135 1.8 and that's got image stabilization it's got the faster linear motor it's really nice as well I would say you know the 85 is maybe better for indoor work low light photography where you have shorter amounts of distance to work with outdoors the 135 is king but although they give beautiful results they're very expensive they're very large and there's something more versatile that I like even better because I love you Canon RF 85 mil macro f2 I mean this lens has image stabilization. F2 still gives you nice bouquet, shallow depth of field. I'm kind of over the ultra thin shallow depth of field portrait shots, but it also gives you macro capabilities and it's way more affordable than the first two lenses that I pointed out. You know, this is the kind of lens that you could go from shooting, you know, group shots to full body portraits, to head and shoulders, to just the eyes, but also like as a wedding photographer, you could shoot rings, you could shoot centerpieces. It's just so versatile, it's affordable, it's great optically, that'd be my choice. Do you know what gets me really high? Shooting macros in parks. And I'm sorry, that's, we're running out of signs is all I got. Uh, but let's talk about macro, we're almost done here. So when it comes to macro, we don't have a lot of options, okay? So first off, the 35mm, not my favorite, doesn't get anywhere close to one-to-one -one macro, lots of loca. I do love the 85mm f2 as a portrait lens and it happens to do one-to-two macro with image stabilization. That's a good choice. I mean, your best choice for professional macro is really your only choice. It's the Canon RF 100mm f2.8. Now, this does have some very unique characteristics. First off, Double duty is a portrait lens. This has interesting defocus controls, and that could be a lot of fun. For macro though, it also gives you beyond life-size macro reproduction, 1.4 to one life-size reproduction. So that's actually pretty incredible, but it is pricey. You pay for it. This is one of the only arenas where I would actually absolutely suggest maybe adapting SLR EF mount glass to your mirrorless body. I mean, something like the affordable 100mm macro f2.8 or the very unique MPE 65 to really do amazing macro. Or look at a lot of the third party choices from Sigma, Tamron, Laowa. This is one area I would take a serious look at that. So I'm kind of seesawing on whether we make this an official category or not. They're talking about super telephoto primes, and I think we'll just kind of do some mentions here. So kudos to Canon for making some very affordable 600 and 800 mil lenses with fixed f11 apertures. That is a great way for people to get extreme telephoto at a good price, but they are absolutely limited in the scope that they can be used in. Otherwise, you've got some excellent high quality prime lenses, but personally, I haven't really had a chance to shoot them. They're insanely expensive and they are basically just Canon's EF formulas with extended mounts. And I really want to see them make dedicated mirrorless formulas that will, for example, do what Nikon's doing, really hitting it out of the park with excellent mirrorless dedicated telephoto prime. So yeah, I think I've decided I'm just not gonna really declare a winner. I mean, the winner's Nikon, I guess, when it comes to mirrorless telephotos right now. 
Well, thanks for joining us for this video. I'm also glad that you came by. You know, the challenge here with Canon RF is just that there aren't that many options available. And although there are some great lenses, a lot of them are fairly pricey. We need to see a lot more affordable primes. I think third-party support would be great, but the problem is Canon just really don't allow any autofocus third-party lenses for their mount. So it's really hard there. Definitely in the comments below, let us know what kind of third-party lenses you would like to potentially see in the future to come out for Canon RF. Now, of course, we can can adapt existing EF lenses from our SLR kit. We've already talked about that. And if you already have those lenses, it does make a lot of sense. But if you don't, I wouldn't personally go out and buy brand new EF lenses to adapt to my mirrorless camera. I just feel like I'd be stuck in this place thinking, well, eventually Canon's gonna come out with more lenses to replace those gaps, right? I kinda wanna see what happens there. So that kinda leaves us in a bad place. And honestly, I feel like the adapting of lenses from SLR kits was something that we really appreciated years ago. Now I really think you wanna look head forward into mirrorless lens designs. Well, hey, if you enjoyed what you saw here today, please subscribe. And you may have already noticed our brand new podcast podcast is out. We'd love for you to join us there as well. You can watch it right here on YouTube or all of your favorite podcasting apps. Check out our Instagram, check out our Twitter. We'd appreciate you following us there too. We'll see you soon with more episodes of Petapixel.